Hey, everybody, Michael Snyder, Pacific Northwest and California Weather Watch doing a La Nina slash Enso and perhaps an El Nino update here tonight. We're going to take a look at where we are, where we are going, because it looks like right now La Nina is on its last legs. And so we'll take a look at that. We'll take a look exactly what uh, uh, Enso is, the El Nino Southern Oscillation right now with the Nino 3.4 region is across the equatorial Pacific. And I'm going to show you why this means so much. It's like, whoa. What does this mean? What's going on across the equator that matters so much across the Northern Hemisphere and the Atlantic Ocean and all across the planet? Well, I'll show you some of that here more in a moment. Uh, and right now, we're still technically in La Nina conditions. As you can see here, Nino 3.4, January 2025. So yeah, we are right there. And here we are in Nino 3.4 as we went through last spring, summer. And then you can see we've been in, in, in La Nina for a time here, but it really hasn't been shown up too much in our weather here just yet across some of the Pacific Northwest. So if we take a look, and you, you heard of some chatter about last year, how it was La Nina conditions, or we were in a La Nina, and technically we never got there at all. And so that's going to be classified as a neutral year. You need five consecutive three-month running periods of negative 0.5 or less. And we didn't get any of those months there. So last year was not a La Nina. It was actually officially a neutral year. And there's no guarantee that this year is going to get here as well. We're probably going to end up with the 0.5 here for November, December, January. But I think that we're going to be trailing off too quickly as we go towards February, March, and April to officially classify it as La Nina. So something interesting there, even though there are La Nina conditions, La Nina conditions across the equatorial Pacific, we're not officially there yet. And it might, again, it might be hard to get there. You can see previous years, how we had some fairly strong El Nino. We had the triple dip La Nina, and then we had some El Ninos back there 2018 into 19 and back and forth here. But yeah, we're kind of stuck in a neutral pattern there. So if we take a look here at the, what the models are saying, here we are as we go on into January. You can clearly see the models are showing the warm-up occurring here. So as we get through February, for example, the dynamic average shows us being out of La Nina conditions into neutral conditions and eventually and slowly moving on in through the spring and on through the summertime back into El Nino conditions. Some models are a bit quick with that as well. I'll show you more on that here in a moment. But right now, La Nina is still present. This was back on January 6th. The cold tongue, tongue extended across the equatorial Pacific Ocean. La Nina getting a little bit scared here as we've got some signs that she is on her way out. This is what's known as a, a Kelvin wave. And this is kind of underneath the surface. You're looking at 50, 100, 150, 200 meters there on the left. And you can see that cold water at the surface. And you can clearly see that warmer water starting to inch in here and really putting the clamps down on La Nina. It's just a matter of time before these winds at the surface are also kind of coming across a bit more out of the westerly. And we're going to get some El Nino conditions again as we go on in through next year. So if we take a look here, this is at the, uh, not at the surface here, but we're looking between uh, the, at the equatorial Pacific. We're no longer looking at the depth in the actual ocean. This is about 5,000 feet, 850 millibars. And you can clearly see the westerly burst coming across here as we go through the month of January on the European model here. At least it's forecast too. And that's really going to start to put the clamps down on La Nina as we saw. So she's probably on her way out as we go through January. By the time we get to February, I expect us to try to move or to start to move into new conditions. So taking a look at uh, this is the a diagram of the sea surface temperature anomalies all the way back towards July. And you can see pretty persistent where the, the above normal sea surface temperatures have been. And then just here at the end of December, we started to switch things up a little bit as that warmer water starts to extend out across the equatorial Pacific Ocean. And again, that's probably the start of our transition towards El Nino conditions. And on the right here, I've got some Kelvin wave activity. You can see these colder upwelling waves. But again, you can kind of see as we went through December, that's now starting to extend its way across Pacific Ocean all the way towards uh, the coast of South America, which likely means the demise of La Nina. So now again, you might wonder, well, what does this have to do with anything here across the rest of the planet? Well, in weather, what happens in the tropics doesn't stay in the tropics. And you can kind of see this is what's known as the Walker circulation. you got deep convection across, let's say, the Western Pacific Ocean here. The trade winds are blowing La Nina. You get upwelling, cooler water coming out across the equatorial Pacific. So as you can see, that changes the deep tropical convection. And that's where all our energy is, is across the tropics. And then that energy wants to be transferred, heat transferred towards the polar regions. And then you get things like atmospheric rivers. You get high pressures, low pressures. You get Rossby waves and big ridges and troughs and all kinds of good stuff out of this. So if I take a look 
uh, at the equatorial uh, view of the entire planet, this might make a bit more sense. As you're looking at dew point temperature here now, and you can clearly see where all that heat, all that water vapor is across the tropics. The atmosphere is deeper here. It's much colder and drier across the northern uh, hemisphere. So again, uh, you're dealing with a lot more heat, a lot more activity across the equatorial region. And you can see these atmospheric rivers in the atmosphere. And again, you got troughs and ridges. And of course, where that cooler air meets, you get the jet stream and you get the mid-latitude cyclones. And so this affects things all the way downstream across the rest of the planet. So yeah, that is kind of what's behind this whole El Nino, La Nina, El Nino, Southern Oscillation thing. Now, let's take a look here a little bit closer. Again, uh, like what happens in the tropics, like I mentioned, does not stay in the tropics, atmospheric rivers and things like that. Again, the Rossby wave configuration. So just kind of driving home that point there. And then you can kind of see how that would play in the deep tropical moisture, trying to move towards the Northern hemisphere here. And you get ridges and troughs and this changes the wave configuration based on if you're in La Nina neutral conditions or El Nino conditions. So uh, one way you can also look at this here is not just by sea surface temperature, you can actually take readings and they've been doing so for a long time for Tahiti versus Darwin. And when you get lower pressure in Darwin, you've got the trade winds, you got La Nina conditions, the deep trop convection is out over the Western Pacific Ocean. And of course, when you've got El Nino, the reverse is true. The lower pressure starts to extend out across the equatorial Pacific Ocean. And you can imagine this is going to change the wave configuration downstream across much of the planet. Of course, the sea surface temperatures are much warmer during the El Nino phase. So right now, the Southern Oscillation is in negative. That's kind of mimicking La, uh, El Nino here. Uh, this was at least through the end of December. It's kind of bounced back a bit here, but we're start to, starting to waffle a bit. You can see we were in positive, which is kind of indicative of La Nina conditions. In December, we went negative, and we're probably going to keep that trend going here if, uh, you know, our best guess anyway, as we go on in through the next couple of months and we start to transition back towards that. La Nina or the El Nino coming up. And also there's some interseasonal variability that happens known as the Madden Julian oscillation. So it's not like you just set El Nino and it's just in place and it dominates the weather in a certain way for the entirety of a winter season. For example, you're still going to have the Madden Julian oscillation moving some of its deep tropical moisture across the planet. The cycles are usually 30 to 60 days. So that's why during an El Nino year, you can still flirt with snowfall in the Pacific Northwest and stuff like that. So it's not just set in stone. There are other uh, inter-season uh, variability that, that is going on. And basically that Madden Julian oscillation Oscillation. And again, you can kind of see that it, it would mimic that walker circulation there, stormy and wet. And again, this circles the planet every 30 to 60 days. And you can kind of see that moving the Madden Julian oscillation. You can see the associated jet stream get extended across Pacific Ocean based on the location of this Madden Julian oscillation. So yeah, fun stuff there. Now looking at where we are going. So this is the forecast. This is issued January 2026. Here we are with the La Nina conditions. And now you can see La Nina's odds really drop down as we get towards February and we go towards the neutral year. So look at that. We start to go to neutral up in this new year. We start to go towards neutral. And look by the time we get towards March, you're looking at what 87, 88% chance of neutral conditions. That neutral starts to tail off. And as we go through the summer months, El Nino starts to rear its head here as we go on in towards next year, which can bring uh, warmer conditions here across a lot of the west coast of North America. You can really switch things up quite a bit. And we'll probably be covering some of that as we go on in through the upcoming months, just so you know we'll get a better picture as we go on a little bit further on into the future here as well. And we'll make sure to kind of show you what's going to happen uh, if we go into an El Nino next year. And it doesn't mean a lot of great things sometimes for lower elevation snow, for example, or for the Cascades of Washington, Oregon, some of the higher terrain. But if we look at the European model here, so this was <clears throat> back in October. You can see this is actually where we ended up. This forecast came out here right at the end of September into October. And you can see it, it's followed along pretty well. And you can also see that, you know, the forecast back in October was for the El Nino conditions to kind of start to take over as we went through the springtime. So the European doing pretty good there. And we're going to go, that's October again. We'll go to December here. Uh, this was last month. And you can clearly see the European model thinks that, hey, we're headed towards at least neutral and probably a moderate, maybe even worse El Nino as we go on in towards next year. <clears throat> and there's the latest one here. This is on, I believe it was released uh, January 1st. And you can clearly see that we are now headed to potentially a moderate or a strong El Nino. So yeah, there we go. Um, 
what else here so we're going to take a look now at what is coming up here because we got the gfs it's running right now but i want to show you some things that are coming in the extended forecast we'll start off by looking at this the artificial intelligence versus the gfs on the right so we have some interesting weather rolling in here as we're quickly getting rid of that trough that brought us some heavy mountain snows here still below normal across much of our higher trend some areas are at getting right towards or above normal but they're kind of select few some areas are still only around 50 60 percent of normal then you can see what starts to happen as we go through the day tomorrow and on and through this weekend we're getting this ridging here and we got that southwest warm flow we're going to be bringing an atmospheric river it could be potentially heavy at times as we go on in through next week it's going to be coming right across the top of this ridge and pointed at the pacific northwest right now it looks to target mainly western washington and british columbia so we're going to be dealing with this ridging and my goodness look at some of these models as we go on into the mid portion of january we go on in through uh what is this now all the way towards next week and the ridging that's showing up on both the gfs the artificial intelligence all models are really showing it been showing it for some time so we have pretty high confidence that this is going to happen Happen. And the GFS, now these are both really dominant ridges here. Very strong. That's like something you'd see in the summertime setting up over the area. And now if we take a look here, and that's not going to mean summertime at uh, temperatures for everywhere. I'll show you what I mean on that here in a moment. And then you can see the ridging just continue. But we have some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. But you got to go way out to see it. So you go about 280 hours out and the artificial intelligence start to show this here. You notice that the ridge is backed up. That starts to allow that north flow to get back down into the Pacific Northwest. And look at this troughing on the eastern periphery of that ridge. That would start to try to bring some colder air into the Pacific Northwest. GFS is basically not having any of it. And then as we go through the extended forecast, you can see the GFS goes to more zonal westerly flow at the very end. So of course, model agreement when you get that far out is just not good at all. All. But if we look at the artificial intelligence ensemble members versus the GFS ensemble members, and we scroll out here again, the ridge, southwest flow, atmospheric river, that is likely coming here to some of the region. We're really going to warm things up across some of the higher terrain as we go out towards January 17th. We're now at January 18th, 19th, still some of that ridging around. And, but uh, the interesting thing is that the GFS and its ensemble members actually have that trough kind of digging out here a bit more than the artificial intelligence does. It keeps it a bit further off to the east. So just kind of a look off into the extended forecast there. Again, not much to discern from that at this time frame right now. But something to take away from all this is that we go through the next few days, look at how warm these temperatures are. My goodness. Ooh, that's so that's going to really do some damage to our snowpack. And then you can see what's going on here. You're like, wait, wait, wait a minute. We're, we're colder than normal across some of the Puget Sound, right? And some of the Willamette Valley. And But the Columbia Basin, well, what are these areas? These are low-lying areas. That's a temperature inversion right there. You're talking about warm conditions across the mountains, and you're locked in some of the fog across some of the lower elevations. So that's what's going on there. And that would continue to damage the snowpack as we go on in towards January 20th. And then as we go off the extended forecast, maybe some colder air tries to work down. But again, no promises on that. Now, let's look at the 18Z GFS data. So this is actual snow depth and inches. You know, we got some decent snowfall across some of the higher terrain of the Pacific Northwest. But watch as I roll through the two-week period. I mean, my goodness, have mercy on us here, Mother Nature, because that is just extremely ugly as we go towards the end of the run. I mean, look at this snowpack is just being demolished by this warm air aloft. I mean, I, I just hope that is wrong. And actually, we have a 0Z GFS running. I want to see where we're at right now. We're at hour 174, and that doesn't look that much better because you can see you know, not doing too bad. We're still below normal overall, generally speaking. But as we go through, like, January 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, you can see as we go off into the future, man, it does not look that great as we really start to do some damage to the snowpack as we move on in through the mid portion of the month. So I just thought I'd share that with you as well. Anyway, um, I'm going to do my normal briefing tomorrow. I just wanted to talk about La Nina and it's on the way out most likely. And again, we'll look at that over the next few months and we'll kind of see where we're going to be headed towards next summer and on in towards next fall and next winter. So anyway, thanks for watching you guys. Um, I will talk to you guys tomorrow and I'll catch you in the next forecast.